I don't get Hotline Miami 2. Like, I don't. I don't know what it's doing. It is a confounding game to me, and this is not my usual take, I know. I'm not an ending explained channel, but I usually say, hey, here's a game. This is how it uses this technique to reveal that theme, which makes us think about these other things. And other times, I will play a game and think, I liked that, and then get on with my life. Not all games require essays. Sometimes I can just play something and move on. That's not the case with Hotline Miami 2. Hotline Miami 2 has so much going on, so many bizarre choices and weird digressions that it seems absolutely made for someone like me to just swim around in and find the central ethos. I should submerge myself in Hotline Miami 2 for a month straight, surface, and with a deep breath say it's about capitalism or addiction, or the military-industrial complex, and all the comments go, yes, thank you, very wise Mr. Geller, so smart. Does anyone else think his beard looks painted on? And I just, I don't know, I don't have it. I don't have the answer. Why do I care so much about Hotline Miami 2? Let's start at the beginning, I guess. So, Hotline Miami 1 was released in October 2012 for PC, and then a little later for various other consoles, it was, to put it lightly, a hit. 2012 wasn't an era without indie games by any means, but the really successful ones were still generally outliers. So for Hotline Miami, a game made basically by two people, to release, get perfect scores from several outlets, and sell hundreds of thousands of copies within a couple months, that was a story. That was a notable level of prestige for a game with this small of a development team, and when you learn what the game is, that success gets even more impressive. Hotline Miami doesn't even get past the title screen before launching an assault on the senses. Strobing colors, a near unreadable font, an endless procession of palm trees, and the blaring, distorted notes of Horse Steppin' by Sun Ara. This is not what most game start screens look like, and it doesn't get any more gentle from here on out. There are, I think, three main components of Hotline Miami gameplay. The first is dialogue, which basically doubles as the game's cutscenes. Characters display their almost always grotesque portrait on the right side of the screen, while dialogue from them scrolls underneath. The player's main protagonist, a guy named Jacket, basically never responds during any of this. There are just characters that talk at you as you click through their dialogue. The second component of gameplay is kind of ambient exploration sections, though exploration is maybe a bit too open a term. Before missions, you can briefly wander your apartment before going to the phone, getting a voicemail, and setting off on a mission proper. After your mission, you often stop in a video store or a bar or a gas station, talk to the attendant, always a character named Beard, and then go pick up a VHS or a drink or a snack. Neither of those two are really the focus of the game, of course. That would be the third section. Horrible, incredible, unmitigated violence. The brunt of your time playing Hotline Miami will be spent in a series of rooms with a bunch of goons bashing the absolute life out of each other. It is a remarkably simple and remarkably enthralling system. You can punch people, knock them to the floor, and then punch them again until they don't get up. They often have melee weapons, which you can use to murk someone before they even hit the ground. They sometimes have guns, which are even better at murder, but have limited ammo and also attract the attention of everyone in proximity. One shot from almost anything at any time will kill you, and the enemies are fast, and more often than not, they will hit you before you hit them. Levels are a brutal mix of memory and reactivity, moving between rooms and hallways as quickly as you can, cycling through weapons and inflicting general atrocities on dudes. You will restart many, many times. And it's through this mechanical repetition that the game can play what I think of as its big trick. 
During the level, lights flash, lives begin and end within fractions of seconds, and the soundtrack goes harder than should be legal. Every single part is designed to drive you forward towards violence and repetition and stringing together the biggest combo of mobsters you can. Then, the second you've killed the last guy in the level, everything stops. The music goes quiet, high score awards stop popping up, you walk back through the level to the exit, and as you do, walk past the brutalized bodies of all the folks you just had such a good time killing. It's very, and I use this term lovingly, early 2010s thought-provoking. Is the violence that we love to do in video games actually bad? Maybe the most famous line of the game, one that's made it into countless fan arts and forum signatures, is posed by an enigmatic man in a chicken mask. Do you like hurting other people? And we think back to the chemically perfect combination of music, pacing, and challenge of those murder sprees and think, yeah, I did really enjoy that. Oh no! What if I'm as unquestioning of the drive to murder as Jacket? This is also, again I say this lovingly, the take you'll find on most critical analyses of Hotline Miami. The actual plot of the game, I think, purposely sidelines itself. With a little critical thought, you can figure out, oh yeah, those weird voicemails that Jacket gets are actually directions on where to go to murder people. When the phone tells you to pick up a load of laundry and be discreet about it, it's not talking about laundry. You can figure out that the people he's killing are largely Russian mobsters. You can even put together all the puzzle pieces scattered through all the levels to find out that this has all been orchestrated by a bizarre organization called 50 Blessings that's determined to stop a Russian-American alliance. But this is going to be something I repeat. I don't think the game actually intends for you to figure all this out, at least not on the first playthrough. The experience of Hotline Miami isn't one of international intrigue and crime web dynamics. It's playing a guy who kills joyfully and unquestioningly over and over and over. I think our main takeaway from Hotline Miami is supposed to be introspection on why we enjoy these things so much. The far more likely end to the game, without all the puzzle pieces put together, is the members of 50 Blessings laughing at you for asking the purpose and saying, paraphrased, you thought there was a point to this? This was a game, you goddamn psycho. This is perfectly in line with the game's trick, the music stopping, and the monotony of everything except the violence. Hotline Miami 1, read on a wiki, might be the story of a mob war fought by unwitting actors in an attempt to affect foreign policy, but the very real played experience of the game has little to do with that. To be clear, I don't think the plot plot is done poorly. I think those hidden revelations add texture and commentary to the game's focus on mindless violence, but because of how it's told and how it will be experienced, I think it's a very different question to ask, what's the plot of Hotline Miami versus what is this game about? The cultural legacy of Hotline Miami, just like the legacy of one of its chief inspirations, the movie Drive, is one of imagery and mood. It's hard for me to not describe some of the resurgence of synthwave and outrun as musical genres, or the neon violence look that's come to define a certain genre of movie, or the general form that 80s nostalgia has taken to Hotline Miami. It is, while not the only factor in any of those movements, a massively influential piece of work. I mean, I literally don't even know how to figure out how many times songs on the soundtrack have been listened to, but I think it's fair to say there are dozens of millions of people who have listened to something like Hydrogen by Moon without ever knowing that it's famous because of an indie video game. And Hotline Miami also has a major hand in our current gaming landscape, because as well as all the titles that took direct inspiration from its gameplay, Hotline Miami sold enough copies and turned enough heads to basically create the game publisher Devolver, or at least boost it to the level of prominence we're familiar with today. You can thank Hotline Miami for those performance press conferences that now happen every year. The point of all this is that Hotline Miami was a big f***ing deal, and I can only imagine that the developers went into the second game with a blank check, but a massive list of expectations. 
number one of these expectations, as I've heard the devs echo in interviews, is how can you even make a sequel? When the first game concludes with such a clear message, how do you follow that up? Well, in the first scene of Hotline Miami 2, released in March of 2015, you play as a man in a pig mask who easily fights his way through a house, killing everyone except a woman upstairs who you appear to sexually assault. But then, a switch is flipped, the scene is revealed to be a film set, and you, the woman, and all the people killed are actors. Okay. The scene was controversial enough that there were stories about it before release, and the game includes an option to skip it. I will say of the many incredibly graphic things in this game, that scene is not one of them. It's quick, obscured, and is almost immediately subverted. In fact, it's so quick and so easily skipped that it kind of begs the question, why is this in here in the first place? I'm not saying that games shouldn't try to approach these topics or it's impossible to depict them well. I'm saying, I don't know what this is doing here. Why does this game start out with actors acting out a sexual assault that's never remarked on again? We learn later that the movie being filmed here is a sort of grindhouse version of the events of the first game, but nothing like this was present in the first game. I have two guesses of the scene's purpose. One is, it's just designed to shock. Most players of the first game will already be familiar with its hyper-violence. Shotgun blasts and curb stomps just wouldn't be as novel this time around, so it's upending audience expectations now with an even more taboo sort of violence. I don't want this to be the case. The first game's forced introspection on violence worked because hitting and shooting people is such a common language for games. This scene is not that. If its purpose is only shock, it's cheap writing, exploitative. If its purpose is only shock, the game has nothing to say about sexual assault at all other than, uh, didn't expect that, did ya? My second guess maybe it's a commentary on how culture distorts and sexualizes violence against women, even though nothing like this was present in the events of Hotline Miami 1, which this movie is theoretically based on, it's added in this scene because the writers or executives of the fictional film thought it needed sexing up. Just after the lights come up and you see the cameras, the director tells you to act more tough and the woman to act more girly. That is something. I still don't think this read is quite enough to justify the scene's presence, but that is a topic with a lot of thematic weight that could be explored and expanded on, and here's the thing, it's not. At least I don't think it is. Hotline Miami 2 leaves this scene as quickly as it was introduced and seems to leave any exploration of that topic behind, but maybe it doesn't. Maybe there is actually a deep cohesion between this scene and the events of the rest of the game, and this is what I keep coming back to when thinking and writing about this thing. Am I just not smart enough to get what it's doing? Am I just missing things? Because Hotline Miami 2 is a lot of things, but it is absolutely not thoughtless, and it's not lazy. There's a lot going on here. An almost overwhelming amount. Let's break it down. In the first game, we have two protagonists, Jacket and another guy named Biker. They do things in basically the same timeline as each other and in the same location, and that's the whole game. In the second, we have almost 10 protagonists, more if you count that some are groups of people and you can play as anyone in those groups. Many of them are actually named, unlike the first game, but many of them still aren't, and it can be seriously difficult to just remember who is who. You've got characters named things like Manny Pardo or Martin Brown doing things alongside characters like The Sun or The Henchman. And if this was the only added complexity, that might be enough. But of course, this game isn't chronological either. Hotline Miami 2 is, this is directly from the wiki, a sequel, sidequel, and a prequel. I mean... It's fine for games to do this sort of thing, of course. Another indie classic, 30 Flights of Loving, introduces characters and different timelines in rapid succession, and that one doesn't even have dialogue. If a game wants its story to be a jigsaw puzzle that the player needs to assemble, that's fine. 
but it's here that I run into that distinction I posed earlier. I can tell you what Hotline Miami 2's plot is. I have solved that particular puzzle. I still can't tell you what it's about. What's the plot? Jesus Christ, okay. So, as the wiki says, there are three different timelines, but each timeline is broken into many different chunks. So, one of the sequel chunks follows that movie actor who you play as in that first controversial scene, who's been a pretty chill actor, but is now using the movie as a license to indulge darker, more violent urges. He lives out several sequences which straddle the line between dreamlike and fantasy, including one where he's on a talk show and speaks about how he loves being given permission to do violence. He fights through several levels which feel very real, only to be revealed to be film sets, but in the last one, the woman he previously was in the assault scene with shoots him, the culmination of the movie. As it turns out, she accidentally shot him for real. The gun had live ammo. But it also follows a group called The Fans, that are literally fans of the events of the first game and want to emulate Jack's actions. But they don't have anyone calling or leaving them messages, so they just mask up and go and kill random groups of drug users and mobsters and stuff, and they keep doing it even after some of the members of the group express reservations, and at the end of their plotline, they go try to take over a house owned by the mob, and they're all killed. There's the mob itself, which is a whole f***ing can of worms. The first interaction you have with them is when you're playing a henchman who the mob boss keeps ordering to go fight the Colombians who have a rival and more dominant gang. The henchman wants out and finds a huge stash of money at one of his gang raids, and he takes it to escape with his girlfriend, but his girlfriend takes the money and runs away without him. He returns to the mafia and sinks into a drug-fueled depression. The fans, before they're all killed, find him and kill him horribly. There's Evan Wright, who's writing a book about the events of Hotline Miami and interviews several of the other characters. He talks to Manny Pardo, a cop who knows a lot about Jacket. It's also about as homicidal as cops come, and he uses his status to frequently kill dozens of people at a time before flashing his badge to get away with it. Towards the end of the game, he starts panicking that people are going to align him with the Miami Mutilator, a serial killer he's investigating, and refuses to go into work. There's the son, a son of the Russian mob boss from the first game, who orders the henchmen around, attempting to fight the more powerful Colombian gang. After the henchman's death, he goes out and starts slaughtering them himself. At his end, he takes so many drugs that he fully wigs out, kills a bunch of his own men, fights some probably hallucinated monsters, and jumps off the roof. In the side pool, a section that takes place at the same time as Hotline Miami, there's a character named Richter, who is actually in the first game and shoots Jacket, and here we find out that he has a sick mom and was also getting death threats from the 50 Blessings group from the first game. And there's also a character named Jake, who's a white nationalist who is also getting messages from 50 Blessings, but figures out who they are and loves it and wants to get more into it, but is captured and killed by either 50 Blessings or the Russians he's supposed to be killing. Finally, the prequel is entirely played from the perspective of the soldier, who is stationed in Hawaii of all places, fighting Soviet bases in increasingly suicidal missions. The soldier is stationed there with a platoon of people, many of whom die. Their colonel also kind of loses his mind and wears a leopard skull on top of his head. Oh, and one of the platoon is Jacket from the first game, and the soldier you're playing as is Beard also from the first game. Finally, for real, in the game's outro, we hear a news report that members of 50 Blessings have taken over some international conference and killed both the US and Russian presidents, and the world has been pushed into nuclear war, and then we watch literally every character still living in the game get nuked. See, I told you. I know the plot. I'm not confused by any of the actual beat-by-beat -beat events that happen here. And in that truncated version of a plot summary, there are probably some things that caught your attention. And they catch mine too, because they're really interesting. Actually, almost every individual beat is really interesting. For example, you've got this guy named Jake who basically recreates the events of the first game, but instead of doing it through a dissociative nihilism that reflects the player's attitudes towards violence, Jake is doing it because of a seething ultra-nationalism. When he puts together that the mysterious phone calls he's getting are from an underground group that wants him to kill Russians, he's thrilled. Being included in the murder gives him purpose, makes him feel included in something. He's clearly wanted this for years. The game calls attention to his love of the Confederate flag not once, but twice, highlighting a link between the Neo-Confederacy and violence that, you know, ain't wrong. But this theme feels like it starts and ends with Jake, whose self-contained storyline ends about halfway through the game. I could say this plotline parallels a general theme of characters looking for an excuse for violence, and this is partially true, the group of fans obsessed with Jacket are looking for any reason to go kill folks, and the actor in the movies talks about using it to indulge his violent impulses. But there are far more characters that dominate larger portions of the story that don't follow this arc at all, and more so, if this is intentional, I don't know what the game has to say about it. Because none of these feel confrontational about the violence the way the first game does. Hotline Miami 2 does the music stops, exit the level thing, just like the first game. But it's expected now, not a subversion. And the fans are, for example, confrontational. 
but about a completely different topic, that is, audience expectations for the developers of a hit indie game. The fans are an intentionally hollow recreation of the first theme, violence for the sake of violence, even unlocking new masks and new abilities in a similar fashion to the original Hotline Miami. They're also all killed relatively early on. Aha, maybe that's Hotline Miami 2 killing off the expectations of the first game and going forward with something new, I guess, but some of the most similar levels to the original game, mechanically and thematically, happen after the death of the fans, so I don't think their killing off can be so neatly deconstructed. There's also the problem of how this story is communicated. As I talked about with the first game, Hotline Miami 2 also has three main modes of interaction, the talking, the nonviolent wandering, and the violence. And just like the first game, those two sections that aren't bashing people's teeth out feel intentionally flat. In the first game, I think you're supposed to reach the point where you're skipping through answering machine messages to get to the fun killing again, mirroring the protagonist's detachment from the other things happening in his life. Even the screen setup enforces this. The picture of who's talking is on the right, but the dialogue is at the bottom left, meaning it's actually easy to ignore who is talking and just briefly scan through what's being said. The dialogue setup is completely unchanged in 2, but the difference is there's massively more dialogue, and the scenes are more important to understanding what's going on. Conversations happen between several different characters at once, and important plot points are only hinted at. It's a style that necessitates close reading. But the dialogue still feels very much like a stopgap between the actual gameplay, because killing stuff is still the meat of the game, and so you're caught between the need to pay really careful attention to who's talking and what's being said and when this conversation is taking place, and the want to just get through all of it, because that's not really why you're here. That tension worked beautifully in the original game, but that's not... The goals aren't the same in Hotline Miami 2, and so that tension feels misplaced. I, I really hope that my body of work shows that I'm not someone who wants or needs to be spoon-fed plot points, but in this case, it just feels like there's a fundamental disconnect between, again, the written part and what the game is about. The most infamous part of the game but also I think the most interesting are the prequel levels, a linear sequence of military missions. I say infamous because these levels are unbelievably hard. They're... Actually, sorry. I have to talk about the difficulty for a minute. There's an interview where one of the devs says that the difficulty is going to be about the same as the first game. This isn't true. It's, it's a lie. It's just not true. Hotline Miami 2 is so much harder than the first game, it's not even a comparison. It's such a ludicrous statement that I halfway wonder if he was making a joke here. Hotline Miami 2 is cruel. It's downright unfair. Enemies react faster than the first game, spot you from further away, pounce on you from around corners. The levels themselves are massive and full of windows, meaning that the sight lines between you and a bad guy's muzzle are near limitless. Gun combat is required far more than the first game, but many of the guns are weaker than the first game. In this level, a guy sees you and immediately kills you, literally while you're standing off screen in the first second of gameplay. There are additions, like the trailer touted dual wielding that are almost completely useless because I cannot imagine a single situation in the game in which spraying and praying in two directions at once would do anything except get you killed. I do not get mad at games often, and Hotline Miami 2's difficulty pisses me off. I frequently return to the first game simply because it's fun to play. Whenever I try to do that with the second, I feel like it punishes me for it. Okay, back to the prequel. So there are these series of missions where you're playing as the soldier, an actual member of the US military, and you're just sent out into the jungle over and over. There's a funny thing that happens with these levels, actually, which is that I was talking about them with friends, and we all referred to them as, oh yeah, those levels in Vietnam. You're even offered an unlockable flamethrower, but they're not in Vietnam. They are, absurdly, in Hawaii. 
you're a troop and you're sent out over and over to kill Cold War Soviets hiding out in Hawaii. And these are some of the hardest missions in the entire game. For one, you can't pick up enemy weapons, you have one gun and one knife. When you run out of ammo, you need to find more from ammo crates sporadically spread around the level. But the odds of that happening versus the odds of you just getting shot in the back by an enemy you never saw, you don't want to roll those dice. It's just brutal level after brutal level. But in this part of the game specifically, the level of difficulty feels like it serves a purpose. These levels are fascinating. The way you're forced to play is much more surgical, risk averse. You can't hold the trigger because you can't afford the ammo. You can't combo enemies together because you have to hide and peek around corners and wait for patrol patterns to line up just right. And the result of this is you're forced into a gameplay style that is more military. Because of how radically different this is, it feels like one of the only times that the game is actually able to interrogate the player in the same way as the first game. Is this murder more acceptable maybe? Because you're not in public spaces, and you're acting with more consideration, and you've been told by the government to kill all these people? This is a section in which the gameplay feels about something in the same way the first one is about interrogating the player's enjoyment of violence. This is storytelling and a point made through gameplay. And although the gameplay is often maddeningly difficult, I feel like it makes sense. In this section, I understand what the game is trying to communicate, and I think it does it fairly well. And although the problems with the dialogue presentation are still present here, if you can look past that, there's some really good stuff going on. So the section is a prequel, because it takes place before the first game, obviously, but the link between the events of the two games is surprisingly nuanced. The soldier that you're playing as is actually Beard from the first game, the guy who was always at the shops you stopped at after each level, and another NPC, one of the only other troops that survives all the missions in Hawaii, is Jack, aka the main character from Hotline Miami 1. Prequels often face the problem of over-explaining things that didn't need to be explained, adding unnecessary detail and backstory, but I think this, showing past military service, is actually an incredibly effective plot point. Jacket's entire vibe in the first game was a shell of a character, one who took direction seemingly without thinking and killed without provocation. The idea of putting that in context of his past military service, giving him history as something very much like a Vietnam vet? I mean, it's not the most original plot point in the world, but it absolutely works. The language in this section makes that link even more evident. The military uses the same communication style as the voicemails from the first game. Obviously coded terms referring to guests and cleaning suites, rather than directly addressing their killings. There's even stuff that seems to have been part of a long-term plan. At the end of Jacket's plotline in Hotline Miami 1, he stands on a balcony and lets a Polaroid slip from between his fingers into the wind, an enigmatic action that we don't have any context for. In the second game, during the Hawaii missions, a reporter takes a picture of Jacket and Beard together, and Beard gives that picture to Jacket after the final level of the section, so the photograph that Jacket throws off the balcony was that photograph, which means he had held onto it for all that time, so it's clearly a way to indicate that he's letting go of his past and maybe even letting go of player expectations, and it also means that... that Beard has actually been dead the entire first game because he was killed in the prequel by a nuclear bomb. I said that everyone in this game dies at the end because of a nuclear bomb, right? Did I mention that? I was talking with a friend about Hotline Miami 2 who said that if you saw any single scene in the game, you'd be like, Wow, this is doing something really cool and specific. Can't wait to see where it goes with this. And then it just doesn't. You might think with how elegantly that prequel section dovetails into the first game that those would be the final levels, but they're not. No, you go back to the sequel timeline and you play more as the mob boss 
who takes a whole bunch of drugs and kills his own men and hallucinates a two-headed duck dragon who you behead with a fire axe and then walk out over a rainbow bridge, which probably just means you jump off the building. And look, that's f***ing cool. Like, that's a rad final level. But what is it doing here? What does it mean? I just... I just don't know, man. I don't know. Hey, it's uh, future editor Jacob here who hasn't been able to sleep for weeks because I keep thinking about Hotline Miami 2. I think I gave this last level too little credit. Something that's obvious in retrospect, but didn't occur to me on my many playthroughs, is that this is the reverse perspective on the fan's last level. The mob boss here takes a bunch of drugs and then hallucinates killing monstrous animals. A bear, a lion, a duck dragon. These are, of course, the masks worn by the fans who were assaulting this place at the same time. So, if we take the fans as a representation of you know, the fans of Hotline Miami 1, it's fairly poignant to show them mutated and monstrous and then murder them. Especially when you consider that the mob boss you're playing as is the son of the final boss of the first game. Does this make the game more cohesive? Well, no. Also, while I'm here in the future, in the time between filming and editing this video, a channel named Ovendal released a video that attempts to untangle things in the same way I have here, and comes away with a much more positive conclusion. It's a really good video, and I'll link it below. Multiple perspectives are good. I am so happy for the people who love this game. Anyway, back to it. If I was reviewing Hotline Miami 2, I'd say that I felt that it was less than the sum of its parts, a bunch of intriguing ideas without the thematic glue to hold them all together, but I'm not reviewing Hotline Miami 2, I just want to understand it. There are lots of games that are nonsense, because they just didn't have the time or budget to pull it together, there are lots of other games with mountains of content that even with all the time and money in the world fail to pursue meaningful ideas or wrestle with challenging topics. This? This isn't either of those. There was so much effort put into this game and I can feel all of it, and even though I can't agree with every decision here, I respect it so goddamn much. This game kind of defies my critical eye. Because yes, all criticism is subjective, and yes, the only experience we can definitively speak from is our own, and no, my subjective personal experience of this game is not something that forms into any kind of broader whole. But I can't bring myself to say that it's a bad game. I think it deserves more credit than that. And while I don't think the attitudes of developers should factor into the critical analysis of a game, for what it's worth, they seem to have made exactly the game they want to. At the end, we see every surviving character in a slice-of-life scene that lasts only seconds before they're each wiped out by a nuclear blast. It feels, after so much plot and so many characters and such intricate a web of connections, like a return to the nihilism of the first game. Everyone's weird little details and anachronisms don't matter anymore. And then a flash of static, a roar of synth, and a title screen for Hotline Miami 3 comes up for just a moment, bleak futurism in front of an apocalyptic skyline. And then it rewinds back to the main menu. It's a flash of punk brilliance, reflecting another thing the devs have said over and over again, there will never be a Hotline Miami 3. Like it or not, understand it or don't, this is all you get. This video was sponsored by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. You know, on YouTube, there are about a thousand things you need to work around. For instance, talking about the first scene of Hotline Miami 2 has 
probably drop the ad revenue on this video to almost nothing. I talked about how rad the music in both these games is, but there are many songs from the soundtrack I can include at all, because they'll cause the video to get copyright claimed. I could continue complaining, but my point is all that makes the goodness of Nebula stand out even more. Nebula is a streaming network created and owned by people like me, writers and video people who want to fix the downsides of this gig. Revenue isn't based on the cleanness of the topic, we can use media examples with the knowledge that we're protected from improper copyright claims, and there are no ads. In fact, instead of this sponsor, on Nebula I'm running down my favorite Hotline Miami 2 songs. Just for kicks. You know, it's almost arrhythmic, and it's really calming. I would almost put it in the same category as, you know, like a save room theme from Resident Evil or something. You can get Nebula for an entire year for less than 15 bucks by clicking on the link in the description, and that's only half the deal, because along with Nebula, you also get access to Curiosity Stream. You might not think that a site with tons of documentaries and nonfiction titles is the ultimate chill spot, but I'm here to tell you that's exactly what it is. As soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to keep watching this thing about deep sea vertical migrations, and man, let me tell you, the vibes are so much more chill than whatever this is. Look, this video's too long already, but if you want to hear me list some of my favorite songs from this confounding game and get a year to Nebula and Curiosity Stream, just follow that link. Then I'll... You'll see me later. Out through the soil and up in the taking a break so the cat can poop.